Well, welcome again to Park Church. Merry Christmas. My name is Matt. I'm a pastor here on staff, and um, I'm really excited for this morning. I love, I love Christmas. I want to start just by recognizing uh, Kelly McCauley. Raise your hand, Kelly. Embarrass you a little bit. Kelly and the team of people who decorated last Sunday and made this place as great looking as it is. Let's just give them a round, round of applause. A group of 20 or 30 volunteers gave a few hours last Sunday to decorate, to make this place what it is, and it looks fantastic. Thank you. It would not be what it is without you, Kelly, so thank you. Um, I also want to say that we are kicking off our Christmas series this morning. It's called Home for Christmas. We'll get into that for a minute, but on the way in, you may or may not have seen these or gotten one of these. This is a, uh, this is a postcard with all of the events that we have going on here at Park over the next month. The purpose of these is because we want you to take a stack of them and bring them home with you, and give one to your neighbor, give one to your coworker, give one to your family member who you would love to see come to one of the events. Uh, there's probably something on here for every kind of person, and so we want, we want these to go out kind of as invitations, and so you're free to take as many of those as you want. We have a lot of them. So we are kicking off our series this morning. It's called Home for Christmas, and uh, that title is not taken primarily from the uh, Bing Crosby Christmas song. Nor is it taken from any of the hundreds of movies that are called Home for Christmas or I'll Be Home for Christmas. Um, It's actually taken from a verse in the Gospel of John. Uh, There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, Matthew and Luke tell the story of what happened at Christmas. That's the shepherds, the angels, that sort of thing. What happened? John tells the story of what it means. What does it mean that God came at Christmas? Uh, We forget this all the time. We get distracted by silver and gold things, by tinsel, by 4K televisions. We get distracted. Let this truth sink in from the Gospel of John this morning. The Word. That's God. That's John's way of talking about God, but it's also John's way of talking about Jesus. The Word became human. Human is you and me, just like one of us. The Word became human and made his home among us. He dwelt among us. One translation says, he moved into the neighborhood. At Christmas, we celebrate that God has come home for Christmas. He's left his heavenly house and stepped into this world where he's come home for Christmas to be God with us, to be God for us, to be God at our side, to be God close to us, to be a God who lives inside of our world, not outside of it, but inside of it, to be a God who lives inside of your home, inside of your relationships, inside of your community, inside of your family, inside of your workplaces, inside of your schools. Finally, to live inside of our hearts. That's the end goal for God, to come at Christmas to dwell inside of our hearts. We just sang it in that song, uh, reign in us forever. That's what we sang about there. The question that Christmas asks you, the question that God presses down in on you, and that we'll explore throughout this season is this, will you receive him home? Will you let him in? Will you, as Joy to the World says, will you prepare him room? Or will you push him out? Now, speaking of preparing rooms, uh, my wife and I are expecting our third child in less than three weeks now. Yes, woo woo indeed. Uh, We have prepared him room. We had to empty out one of our bedrooms and prepare room for the child. I said him. It's not a boy or a girl. We don't know what it is. It's one of those two. We don't know what it is. We have two boys now, so I always keep saying him. Uh, We've prepared this child room. The walls are painted a a lame beige because we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Everything's brown and green because that can kind of go either way. The diapers are stocked. Uh, The wipes are ready to go. We have prepared this child room in our house. We can't wait for this baby to come. We are expecting it warmly, eagerly. It's coming. When Jesus was born, 
His reception into this world was nothing like that. It was not warm. It was not eager. It was not safe. Jesus was born into this world under much duress, under scandal, under a threat of death. Jesus was born into this world as a refugee. He was not received well when he came to this home. And not just when he was born, but throughout the the whole of his life. Just a few verses earlier from this up here, John says that he came to his own people. He came to his own home, and his people did not receive him. They didn't accept him. They tried to push him out. Will you accept him? That's what Christmas asks. And so throughout the series, throughout the season, we're going to look at different Christmas stories, different characters, and look at how they either did or didn't receive Jesus and what that can teach us. This morning, we're going to start not with something nice, not with something pleasant, not with shepherds and angels and baby Jesuses. We're going to start with the worst, the worst story, the worst character, the worst person in the Christmas story, probably in the New Testament, maybe one of the worst people in the history of the world, not to engage in hyperbole. We're talking about King Herod here. King Herod's story comes in the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the first book written about Jesus' life. And we'll look through it. Here it is. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So here's the scene just right off the bat. Um, You know the song, We Three Kings? That's what this is all about. We Three Kings of Orient are bearing gifts. We traveled afar. That's all I know. Um, uh, If you love that song, or if you love the kind of picturesque images that go along with that song, I hate to break it to you, but almost nothing in that song is historically accurate. Um, There weren't three of them. No one, I mean, there could have been three of them, but there could have been two, and there could have been 52. We have no idea. Um, So three is right out. They probably, they were definitely not kings. Um, They were just wealthy guys. And what they were, you've heard of the term magi, right? It's where we get the term magic from. These were kind of ancient astrologers who were sort of religious advisors to their home kingdom, which was probably somewhere where Iran is. So these were uh, religious experts, astrologers, magicians to a foreign land, to a different religion altogether. Uh, And if you like the image of him, of these kings, wise men coming to Jesus in the in the little manger, get that out of your head too. This was probably about two years after Jesus was born. So he wasn't a baby anymore. Uh, At two years old, you're walking and talking. If Joseph and Mary were were ahead of the curve, they may have potty trained Jesus by then. He's he's learning his ABCs at this point. Uh, This was during the time of King Herod. The time of King Herod was crazy town. I'm going to tell you a little bit about King Herod. He was king of the whole land, uh, Palestine, Judea, Israel, Jerusalem, the whole area. He was king of all of it. About 60 years prior to this, Rome had come in, conquered the whole land, and Rome never wanted to occupy these kind of foreign lands because they're difficult to occupy. And so what they did was they chose a local leader who they could rule through. And that local guy was Herod. Uh, At this point, he's about 60, 65 years old. He's been ruling, he's been king of this land for about 30 to 35 years. Now, to be king, to be ruler in a Middle East land for 35 years is a difficult task. Today, as it was then. Uh, To rule that long, you had to be two things. You had to be brilliant, and you had to be brutal. And Herod was both of those. Herod was a brilliant guy. He was a smart, uh, political, cunning man. He was big. He was impressive physically. Uh, He led numerous armies into battle and won successfully. He had a lot going on for himself. He invested a lot of his kingdom's money into infrastructure projects, into building and whatnot. He built fortresses along the eastern border to keep it safe. He built palaces. He built roads, aqueducts. Uh, He built a big port on the Mediterranean Sea that was really the first of its kind back then. He invested a lot. He actually rebuilt 
the temple in Jerusalem. It had gotten destroyed a long time before, and he rebuilt it, not to its former glory, but he rebuilt a kind of cheaper version of it uh, in the middle of Jerusalem because he wanted to win the favor of the people. He even became Jewish uh, kind of in the same way that our politicians use religion to kind of get elected. Um, He did the same thing back then, too. He was brilliant. He was smart. He was cunning. He was savvy. He knew how to get things done. Herod was also, though, brutal. He had, over the course of his life, ten wives, at least ten wives. The reason he had these ten wives um, was because as soon as he got tired of one, he would either banish her and the children to a different place, or if it was easier, he would just kill them. He would have them killed. He had three of his adult sons executed, uh, two of which he had strangled at his command. Um, He didn't just kill people, though, who were close to him. If there was an uprising, if there was a town that was giving him a hard time, he would just just kill everyone. Diplomacy was not one of Herod's strong points. Uh, A few more things about Herod. One is he actually had his favorite wife killed. He loved this woman, but she was becoming politically too kind of opposed to him, and so he had her killed, his favorite wife. And after he had her killed... He started to lose it a bit. He would walk around the palace calling out her name, calling for her because he missed her. And when she wouldn't come, he would get mad. He would call his servants to go and fetch her. Go and find my wife. And I don't know what they did. I guess they would look for her, not find her because she was dead. And when they couldn't find her, he would just have them beaten to a pulp. This was who Herod was. Uh, Towards the end of his life, Herod had a, had a terrible kidney disease. He was in a lot of pain for the last year or two of his life, probably around the same time that this happened. Uh, towards the end of his life, he realized that his end was coming, and so he ordered all of the important people of Jerusalem, all of the religious leaders, the business leaders, uh, all of the political leaders, he ordered all of them be rounded up and put in prison. And he gave the order that on the day that he died, all of those people would be brought out of prison and killed as well. Because he knew that on the day that he died, no one would mourn his loss. But if all of those important men were killed on that day, he knew there would be mourning across the land. What a guy. That's Herod. Uh, Brutal, brutal. His entire life was built around making a name for himself, around staying alive, staying in power, guaranteeing his throne even after he was dead. It's what the fortresses, it's what the building projects, it's what eliminating the political rivals, it's what it was all about, maintaining his kingdom, maintaining his place on the throne, maintaining his place in history, his legacy. Now, legacy, have you ever, ever considered your legacy? I imagine as you get older, this is something you do. As I have kids, I've begun to consider my legacy a little bit. Legacy is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to want to leave a good legacy. We're kidding ourselves if we don't want our kids and our grandkids and the people who know us to look back at us and say, I'm proud that he was my dad. I'm proud that he was my granddad. I work at the hospital as a chaplain, and every day I get to sit with families and talk about legacy. I get to talk about, uh, you know, people who are towards the end of their life. I get to meet with them and ask them, what was mom like? Just this past Wednesday, actually, I sat with a family of a 90-year-old woman who was towards the end of her life. Uh, She was sort of the matriarch of the family. And I asked them, you know, what was mom like? Tell me about her. And they went on and on. They talked about how inspirational she was, about how self-sacrificing she was, about the adversity she faced with courage and the lessons that they all learned from her. One of her daughters, with tears in her eyes, looked at me and said, I am who I am because of her. That's a life-giving legacy. The kind of legacy that you and I want. The legacy that lives on and inspires people after you have gone. Legacy like that, that's that's good legacy. Herod, his legacy is brutal. His legacy is the opposite of life-giving. It's life-depriving. His is a legacy of death. 
The picture of his life is one that is always grabbing at things, trying to hold on to everything for himself. It's paranoia, an unquenchable thirst for more. It's a restless struggle for security, a life of violence and hate and a life of ruining others so that his place, his throne, his legacy could be cemented. That's what he was concerned with. So when Herod finds out why these wise men have come to Jerusalem, it shakes him. Listen to what happens. The wise men come, they ask, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Now homage is worship. It's another word for worship. These wise men have come to see the new king and to give him praise. They come to Jerusalem, the place where the palace is, the place where kings live. They come to Jerusalem, they meet the king of the Jews face to face and ask him, where's the real king? In Herod's mind, what he had built his entire life around was being just that, the king of the Jews. Not born king, but taking the throne by ambition and by politics. In his mind, he is king. He is the only one who's worth worshiping. It's his star that's worth knowing. He built the roads. He built the fortresses. He built the temples. He is the one who is worthy of worship. He and him alone. And so you can anticipate his response. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened. Remember, he was greatly paranoid. He was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes, he inquired where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. Uh, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers. For from you, from Bethlehem, shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people. Herod was frightened. He was deeply troubled at the idea that another king could possibly be born. A true king who could pull the rug out from his rule from his legacy. He knew that in ancient Judaism, there was always a rumor that someday a Messiah might be born, a king might come that would liberate the people. And this troubled Herod deeply. So he gathers all of the religious leaders together and wants to know where this child is. Now, it says all Jerusalem was troubled with him. And there's good reason for this. When a group of foreign religious leaders come into the center of town, come to the palace, bang on the door, and ask where the real king is, and it troubles crazy King Herod enough to gather all the religious people together, the town's going to hear about this. And knowing what kind of man Herod was, what kind of ruler he was, they were right to be troubled, to be worried. Because who knows what Herod would do? So what would Herod do? Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. Now, the wise men don't know this. They don't know Herod. But he's not looking to go to Bethlehem to worship this child. What Herod wanted was to gather intel on this child because if he was who they said he was, if he was a real threat to his kingdom, Herod was prepared to do what he had to do to maintain his throne. So the wise men leave. They go and find Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And you know this part of the story. They bow down. They worship. They open their treasures, frankincense, gold, and myrrh that they had traveled with to present him with. After they do that, they're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, but to go a different route, so they do. After that, Joseph is warned, uh, take Jesus and get him out of there. Bring him to Egypt, because Herod is trying to kill him. So as a refugee, Jesus and his family escape safely to Egypt. Now, that part of the story you know. This part you might not know, because this part doesn't make it onto Christmas cards, and it doesn't make it into many children's pageants. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem 
who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. So what would Herod do? This is what Herod would do. Murder all of the boys who were in that same age range as Jesus would have been. Now, Bethlehem was a small town, but there was still estimated between 10 and 30 boys slaughtered that day, all under the age of two. And along with them, you have to imagine 20 to 60 moms and dads who would have fought like hell for their kids' lives. Can you see the horrible things that are in Herod's world? Can you see the misery brought on the lives touched by Herod's paranoia and jealousy and insatiable thirst for legacy? Can you sense the darkness that enveloped everything Herod held dear, the fear, the violence, the evil? All because he had no room in his kingdom, no room in his world for another king, a true king. Herod reigned on his throne and him alone. He had no room for Jesus. He could not stand for Jesus to come into his home, to come into his kingdom at Christmas. Now here is where this story turns from being about a child king and magi and a monster to being about you and I. The message of Christmas, and it's the undercurrent of everything in this Herod story, the message is that Jesus has come to be king of the world. We'll sing joy to the world later. That's what that song is all about. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. What's the next line in that song? Let every heart prepare him room. Here's the part that I want you to connect with, the part I want you to get. Jesus has come to be king of the world, king of the whole earth, and that means also that Jesus has come to be king of your world, of your little worlds. All that stuff I said earlier, your families, your marriages, your businesses, your school, he's come to be king of your inner world, the part that you spend the most time with, what goes on in here, what you do with your body, what's in here, your heart. That's where Jesus has come to be king of. He has come to unseat every king that wants to falsely rule over us, to reign in us, so that he can take his rightful place on the throne of our hearts, to reign in us, to reign through us, to reign over us. What this means for us is everything. This touches every area of our lives. He has come to be king, and he is king. The question that this story asks you, again, is this. Will you make room for him? Will you make room for him to be the king of your life, the king of your world, or will you, like Herod, attempt to push him out? How will you receive him? Now, before you answer that question too quickly, here is the rub. The one connection I haven't made yet is that, unfortunately, we're all a lot more like Herod than we'd like to think. He's lifted up as this shining, splendid, negative example of horror and evil. But we all have a little King Herod in us. Herod dies, of course. Jesus can come back out of Egypt. But even though Herod is dead, a little King Herod lives on in each of us. Sometimes subtly, sometimes it's impossible to miss. Hopefully, we're not as historically bad as Herod. But we all have a little King Herod in us. Because who doesn't sometimes want to be the center around which everything else turns? And who else doesn't get mad when that doesn't work out like that? Or sometimes, who doesn't want to use your position, the power that you do have, to lift your life above someone else's, to make your life easier or better or more comfortable, even at the expense of someone else? Have you ever found yourself putting your desires and wishes above what someone else needs selfishly? Have you ever pushed away people or pushed away God because you don't want your throne to be threatened in any way, your crown to be threatened, your place of power? Little King Herod is at the core of every human heart. This is a fundamental principle, not just of this story, but of the entire scripture. If you read read Romans 1, you'll see this clearly and obviously. At the core of every human heart is a voice that wants to suppress the truth, 
like Herod did, that wants to eliminate any contender from the throne, that says to us, no one tells you what to do. I am in charge of my life. I reign here. I am king. We do our very best to filter this out. We do our very best to be a team player. We do our very best to be generous, to be helpful, to hide that instinct. But no matter how hard we try, in every human heart, there is that little King Herod who wants to rule, who wants it my way, who is threatened by anything and anyone that would compromise our power. Most of all, God. Listen to the way one writer puts it. I love this. He writes, Herod is not dead. Herod lives on in us. The exaggerated ambitions, the pretension, self-centeredness, greed for position, grudge against God, guile, and finally, human cruelty and insensitivity, which are all the fruit of our war with God, all these still live in us and must be contended with until the last judgment. Human nature, he writes, human nature is still the battleground between two great kings, Herod and the child. We know who overcomes, but meanwhile the battle rages. And Herod is here as a warning to every Christian of who he or she in no little measure still is. So let's let Herod stand in as a warning for us and ask this question again. Will you Make room in your life for Jesus. Will you go to Bethlehem like those wise men and worship him, offer him gifts, receive him as king, and let him take his rightful place on the throne of your heart? Or will you go to Bethlehem only seeking to eliminate him? My call to you this morning, it's a simple one, throughout this whole Christmas season is this. Open up your world to another king, to the true king. Let him come into your home this Christmas season. Even if it's just one simple step that you take, my call is for you to take it. It's a pretty simple message this morning. Make room for Jesus to be king of your world. The question, of course, is what can this look like? It sounds very simple, but what can this look like for him to be home in our lives? It will look different for each and every one of us. For the person who is here and maybe back at church for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, maybe you were brought here by a friend, maybe you don't know how you got here. For you, the one step might just be coming back next week and the week after and through Christmas and over and over again hearing about this king that has come, hearing about who he is, how much he loves you and how he wants to make room in you. The step is for you just to come back to leave all the preconceived notions of God at the door, all of the horrible things you've heard about the church, all the doubts, all of the questions, all of the yeah buts. You can still have them. You can still hold on to them. But through this Christmas season, open your heart to the possibility that God might actually be wanting to come and live inside of you, which is a miracle. Like the wise men, the step for you to take is just come with an open mind. Seek him out. Search for him. Find him. And if you get that far, worship. For the person here who, like Herod, has allowed his or her heart to be shaped by negativity, who has allowed little King Herod to rule in here in a way that ruins things for you, whether it's justified or not, this Christmas season, seek to allow Jesus and his joy and peace and hope to reign in your heart instead, rather than giving in to all of that negativity. Last week, if you were here, uh, Doug spoke about resentment. If you missed that sermon, go back and listen to it. If resentment is something that rules in your heart, ask Jesus to take it from you and have him sit there instead. If little King Herod rules your heart by jealousy or by anger or greed or unforgiveness, ask Jesus to come in to kick him out and to reign there instead. It's a shame that uh, tomorrow night we're wrapping up the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course because for the people who have attended that course, it has been wildly successful and amazing uh, in, in just this, kicking little King Herod off of your throne to free you up to follow Jesus better. We'll do that course again. If you need help with that, 
Next year when we offer that course, go to that. But this Christmas season, and I know this isn't easy, give up the negativity, the resentment, the jealousy. Try your best to do that. Ask God for help with it. Because sometimes we like to just hold on to these things because it gives us power over our heart. Give that power to Jesus. Let him reign with gratitude and joy and forgiveness. Make room for him there. For you this morning who's here, who's been following Jesus for some time, and maybe faith for you has just become kind of bland. It's grown stale. It's lost its luster. For you this morning, this Christmas season, making room for Jesus might just look like serving him in a new way, in a way that's more meaningful, that's more purposeful. And there is... a. Uh, Thousands of ways to do this. But this is where little King Herod comes and whispers in our ears. You've been doing faith like this for so long. Don't change a thing. Don't change a thing. No one tells you what to do. No. Let Jesus be the king of your faith, not little King Herod. So find a new way to serve. In the church, this looks like a thousand things. You can volunteer to help at any of the events that we have listed here. We always need child care. We always need teachers. We always need people people to help clean up. There are teams that we need people to serve on. You can always do that. The wise men come, and one of the gifts they offer is gold, Um, straight cash. Uh, (laughs) One of the things that we're doing is we're we're in the middle of a final end-of-the-year push to raise money to hit our budget this year. Uh, Maybe one of the ways that God is calling you is, is to give in a more substantial way than you have before to help us reach that budget. Outside of the church, there's also thousands, millions of ways to serve Jesus in a different way. Your elderly neighbor who just came home from the hospital, go to her house and spend time with her because she's probably lonely and could really use your help. Volunteer at lunch break, the food bank. We have a Christmas tree in the back hallway back there with little name or tags on them to give gifts for for families that need gifts. Do that this Christmas season. It could be as simple as reaching out to your coworker who you know is going through a divorce and is about to endure the most difficult Christmas they'll ever endure without their kids. Just be kind, patient, loving in a way that you haven't before. That's what it looks like, maybe, for you to receive Jesus into your home, into your heart, to be your king. It doesn't have to be all of them. It can just be one of them. But this Christmas season, take one concrete step to open up your world, your home to him. Give up the way that little King Herod inside of you wants to hold on to everything you have and try, just try this Christmas season giving the reins over to Jesus and see what he does through you. If you were to do this, if we were to do this, what could this mean for you, for me, for us? I talked earlier about legacy about how King Herod's entire life was around building his kingdom up, about having his name written in stone, about cementing, cement, cementing, yeah, cementing his legacy for all time. Do you know how King Herod's legacy was finally defined? It wasn't by the building projects. It wasn't by the palaces built or the forts or the ports or the roads, whatever. His legacy wasn't cemented by the temple that he rebuilt in Jerusalem, which only got destroyed 70 years after this. We don't remember him because of how great a king he was or because of all the power he amassed or the wars he won or the people he led. His legacy was written by his response to that child king. His legacy was written by his answer to this question right up there. He wanted to be remembered for all of that stuff. He wanted to be remembered for the kingdom he had built, for the throne he had won. He wanted to be remembered like that. But do you know why we remember him? We remember him as a mere footnote, a plot device in the story of a poor little peasant boy in pull-ups who lives in a rural town not six miles from where Herod sat on the throne that day. Not six miles. Do you know how far that is? That's like from here to Red Bank. Herod could have walked there that day. Herod could have decided that if this 
These wise men are correct. If this child really is the king, I am going to go to Bethlehem. I am going to see myself. And if this child is who they say he is, who the prophet says he is, then I'm going to hand over my crown, give him my throne that day. But he didn't. That's how close Herod came to having a completely different legacy. Not six miles. He could have been there in under an hour by horse, a few hours by foot. That's how close we all have, we all are, to having a different legacy written. Because our legacy, yours, mine, us as a church together, it's not about how much money we make. It's not about the power we have. It's not about the houses we build. It's not about the cool things we do for ourselves. Our legacy will be written by how we respond to this question, by how we respond to the child born at Bethlehem, who is our king. Will you receive him in? Will we, as a community, continue to receive him in in new ways, week after week, month after month, year after year? That is what this story asks of us. If we do, if you do, if we do together as a community, who knows what sort of legacy Jesus will leave through us? A legacy of a people who deeply and truly and really love their neighbors and change the lives of the people who they are around. A legacy of a community that changes Monmouth County, that makes an impact for people. A legacy of hundreds, if not thousands of people who one day come to follow Christ. A legacy of mercy for those who are poor and oppressed, for those who are lost who are, who are outcasts, who are downcasts, who are just plain out of it. A legacy of light and hope and meaning for a world that really kind of favors darkness and that cozies up to meaninglessness more and more. A legacy of a community that fights against every King Herod in the world in order to favor the King of love, the King of peace, the King of joy, the King of hope, the King of glory. That is what is at stake for you, for me, for us when we answer this question. So this Christmas season, my invitation to you is this. Let's prepare him room. Let's welcome in the king of glory. Let him enter into our lives and change things. This Christmas season, welcome him into your home for Christmas. Now before we pray, I'm going to invite the musicians to come forward and lead us in a, um, it's a new song for us. And it asks these very same questions. Uh, you'll pick up the choruses really quickly. Um, when we sing, as you sing, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him to come into your world, to come into your life, to sit on your throne and change things for you. Ask him to come in to make his home among you, and to make this Christmas season a time where you know him and follow him in a way that you haven't ever before. Now, as they prepare, let's pray that God would do this. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for coming at Christmas time, for being our God, for being God with us, for being God for us, for coming into this world and bringing light and life and hope and meaning. Lord God, you know the King Herods that reign on our hearts. You know the things that keep us from you. You know the things that we don't want to give up. God, we pray that you would give us the courage and the faith to give them up. And just to rely on you, to fall into you, to let you come into our hearts, our homes, our lives, our thrones, and reign in us. Lord Jesus, our hearts are filled with all sorts of things that it shouldn't be filled with. And so we pray that you would help us now to prepare room for your son to dwell in us through faith. We pray, Lord, that you would come and enter into our lives, change our lives, and change this community to be a place of light and life for all of those who need it in the world around us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, and our King. In his name we pray. Amen.